Kevin Haggerty with David Frame, author of Framing Decisions, Decision-Making that Accounts for Irrationality, People, and Constraints. Now, David, uh, we were talking about uh, Chapter 3 and the social context of decision-making, but now let's turn our attention to Chapter 4, which discusses the organizational dimension. Uh, in Chapter 4, you investigate four factors, uh, organizational structure, organizational process, people in organizations, and organizational culture. Right. Could, could you say uh, a bit about each of these? Sure. Okay. Uh, uh, the reason I set aside a, a whole chapter dealing with the organizational dimension is that uh, it's uh, uh, pretty clear when you think about uh, the decisions, say, that you make and the decisions that you know have been made that uh, in making a decision, uh, behind the scenes, there are many constraints imposed on you in making the decision by your organization itself. Okay, uh, uh, some of your decisions, uh, you're not permitted to make these decisions because the rules of the organization say you can't make these kinds of decisions, etc. So uh, uh, that's why I have a whole chapter dedicated to exploring the organizational dimension. And as you mentioned, uh, what I do is in this chapter then is to examine briefly the uh, impacts of uh, uh, organizational structure, organizational process, people in organizations, and culture on, the deci on, on how decisions are made and implemented. Okay, now uh, you're asking me to do a brief summary, so uh, I'll keep it very brief. With organizational structure, okay, we have to acknowledge that uh, uh, the way an organization is actually laid out, okay, the way it's actually physically designed, uh, has an impact on how people uh, do and can make decisions. Uh, for example, if you're in a military organization, uh, your primary structure that you're dealing with is the chain of command structure. So in a chain of command structure, uh, a sergeant reports uh, to uh, the lieutenant, the lieutenant reports to the captain, the captain reports to the major, and so on, possibly right up to a, uh, a four-star general. Okay, but the, with the structure uh, uh, of a chain of command system is that you have very clearly defined hierarchy okay, of, uh, of, of control, a hierarchy of, of power. Okay, now, uh, that has big implications for decision making. For example, uh, someone who's low in the chain is not permitted to make independent decisions without getting authorization from uh, players above them in the chain. Okay, so again, that's, that's just a... a uh, uh, a constraint that the uh, uh, chain of command structure places on someone making decisions within the uh, within a, uh, the uh, chain of command uh, environment. Okay. Now contrast that uh, with, uh, say, uh, a self-managed team structure. With a self-managed team structure, you'll have, uh, say, five or six team players who collectively uh, uh, have uh, authority. They have collective responsibility and authority for the operations of the team. And uh, one decision-making implication is that when you have self-managed teams, uh, you're looking for uh, collective decision-making. So uh, in, a, in a typical self-managed team environment, each of the players gets to, uh, to uh, say something about their views on how a decision should be made. Uh, and they even may even get to, to vote on, uh, on whether decision A or deci decision B should be supported. So it's much more of a democratic process. So in the discussion uh, that I have in the book on uh, organizational uh, structure, uh, I'm, I'm discussing these kinds of things. I, I'm discussing what I call organizational architecture principles. Okay, with organizational architecture, you take a look at the structure of a, of a, of a, of a team or a working group or a, a whole uh, enterprise, and then based on that, you, you can even diagram it. Sit down on a piece of paper, diagram the pieces of the structure, okay, and then you can, uh, uh, based on that diagram, start predicting what are the decision-making consequences arising from that structure. So that, that, that takes care of organizational structure. In regard to organizational process, I don't really need to say much more, okay, because process and structure are very closely intertwined. Okay, in a chain of command structure, you have the sergeant reporting uh, uh, to the lieutenant reporting to the captain reporting to the major, okay, the process we have there says that you cannot make a decision independently as a sergeant without reporting to people higher than you in the chain. 
So the process and the, and the structure are really uh, almost uh, inseparable uh, more often than not. Okay, so, but you need to be aware that organizations do have processes, and the processes also give you the do's and don'ts. Okay, thou shalt do this, thou shalt not do this, and uh, again, if, uh, when you're trying to make a decision, if, if, uh, if, it, if the uh, process says uh, you are not permitted to talk to a client, okay, to get information, okay, then clearly client input, direct client input isn't going to be uh, uh, open to you when you're trying to gather data for a decision. Okay, uh, people in organizations, that's the, th that's the third factor, and uh, that's all encompassing. All we're saying here is that organizations are comprised of people, okay, and uh, these people have different perspectives, they have different motivations, they have different psychological points of view, uh, they have different degrees of competence, and uh, uh, to a certain extent, probably half of the book that I've written is dealing with those people issues, so I don't really need to... Uh, uh, beyond mentioning that people issues are an important organizational issue, I don't really need to go into those details. Now, they're covered elsewhere in the book. And then finally, a very important uh, factor, okay, is the organization culture. Okay, and the culture uh, is, uh, when you talk about culture, organizational culture, it's kind of like in anthropology, uh, when the anthropologists used to study the culture of different tribes, okay, uh, in, the, in the jungles of Peru, or in the tribes of the... Uh, 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 Sahara or whatever. Okay, so a, a culture means that uh, the uh, an entity, a collection of, of players, has certain rules, roles, and relationships that they establish and follow. Okay, and these these rules, roles, and relationships are embedded in the culture. People are only uh, uh, very often they're only uh, semi-consciously aware of these uh, these rules, roles, and relations. It's only in practice. If you break a rule, suddenly everybody realizes, uh oh, you've broken the rule. Okay, or if your uh, your relationships with another member of the community are inappropriate, it's only through the inappropriateness of the of the uh, relationship that suddenly it, it goes on people's radar screens. So, uh, uh, so those are those are the four uh, factors I look at and explore in uh, some detail in this chapter. Could we uh, go back to uh, organizational structure? Sure. And I wonder if you could. Just briefly give uh, maybe the, the, the pros and cons of a ch chain of command versus a self-directed team. I is one better than the other? Are they simply different? What are the strengths and weaknesses of these structures? Well, uh, in decision making, uh, it's not really a question of one being better than the other. Uh, uh, for example, uh, a very famous chain of command business structure was the, uh, uh, the structure that governed uh, how electronic data systems, EDS, uh, was uh, governed, uh, uh, in particular, when uh, H. Ross Perot okay, was the uh, CEO of EDX. And it was run like a military organization. And uh, everybody, uh, the rules were very clearly established. Uh, you, who you reported to and who reported to you, these things were clearly laid out. And uh, EDS uh, was very effective. They were one of the most successful uh, uh, systems integration companies. In fact, they were the very first uh, IT company uh, in the United States and the world to see the value of systems integration, okay, back in the 1980s, and then to go out and to sell uh, uh, to sell their systems integration services. But but they operated in a very much a, almost a paramilitary para organization fashion. Uh, on the other hand, you'll have something uh, today. You'll have organizations like uh, Google, okay, and Google prides itself of being very hang loose. Okay, and uh, a certain portion of your day, you should be just sitting there and uh, grooming your mind and making yourself smarter and being creative and these kinds of things. And there's a tendency when you make a decision to make sure you get the buy-in of other players and get their inputs and so forth. So uh, yeah, if you work at Google and you try to impose uh, a chain of command structure, okay, uh, it, it ain't going to work. Uh, by the same token, at EDS, if you try to pr uh, promote a self-managed team structure in, 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 the, in the sense that they have it at Google, that isn't going to work either. So, uh, so ultimately what you need to do is determine uh, when you're, say, doing a decision analysis uh, in, in the organization that I'm working in, okay, uh, what is our overall culture and uh, what uh, uh, decision process is most appropriate uh, to this particular culture. Okay, well, uh, talking about organizational structure, uh, obviously these, uh, these have consequences. 
but uh, the culture, as you mentioned, also does, uh, you do look at three broad categories of culture. Uh, could you say a few words about those? Uh, in the book, I talk about uh, three categories, as you mentioned. Uh, one is the Athenian, Athens, the Athenian versus Spartan cultural outlook. Okay, and uh, basically, and by the way, I, did, I don't even pretend to make this a comprehensive listing of cultural factors that people need to be aware of. These just happen to be three dominant uh, cultural uh, outlooks that uh, I find uh, uh, have a, a big impact on, on uh, how decision making uh, in organizations is carried out. But Athenian refers to the, uh, uh, the, the world's first democratic uh, republic, okay, in Athens during the age of Pericles and the uh, uh, fifth or sixth century BC, where you actually had the community involved in making collective decisions for the first time in, in, uh, in, in, in sort of a large-scale community that, uh, in, in human history. Uh, even as Athens was practicing the rudimentary democracy, you had a neighbor called Sparta uh, uh, carrying out uh, uh, the very, being very militaristic, okay, and basically being very controlling. Okay, there's probably never been a more militaristic, uh, substantial culture that at least that we're aware of in, in history than the, uh, the Spartan culture, where basically uh, children were taken from their families uh, at a very young age, especially boys, and then they spent the rest of their lives serving the military and carrying out military exercises and fighting Sparta's wars for them. So in the Spartan culture then, just as even the term Spartan means it's a uh, it's, uh, it's not lavish, it's very primitive, it's very simple, it's to the point, okay, uh, Athenian is more relaxed, uh, you're trying to, you're more open to uh, opposing points of view, Spartan, Spartan points, uh, the Spartan culture, when the, 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 the big kahuna, when the key guru says this is what we're going to do, everybody salutes, ours is not to reason why, ours is but to do or die, and Athenian, you sit there and someone says this is what you do, and you go, well, have you thought about such and such, okay, so clearly, Again, uh, there's a major decision uh, making implications associated whether you have an Athenian or a Spartan outlook. Uh, another uh, major culture, cultural outlook issue that has a big impact on decision making is whether your culture promotes risk taking or whether it's risk averse. And the curious thing here is that everybody, if you look, take a look at the business literature, uh, virtually all the CEOs and all the senior managers of corporations say, uh, you know, if you don't do, if you don't take risks, uh, you're going to die. Risk taking is is really the key to moving ahead, and so on and so forth. But in practice, very few organizations are risk taking. And even no matter what the senior managers say, and no matter how much uh, 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 sort of energetic uh, 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 sort of uh, chats they have to really motivate people and all this kind of thing, off sites that they have where people get worked into a frenzy. No matter how much of that goes on, in practice, the procedures their policies, uh, the way uh, who gets promoted and who doesn't get promoted is, is uh, it's just uh, it's saturated with implications uh, saying don't take risks because if you fail or, you, or you're not entirely successful you're not going to get ahead, you're not going to uh, get a commission, these kinds of things. So, uh, uh, so again, risk taking versus uh, risk avoidance, uh, these are very important things uh, to take into account. A risk taking decision maker is going to do things uh, that a risk avoiding decision maker would never even think about doing. Okay, so the risk taker has far more open avenues of pursuing things. On the other hand, it's risky. Okay, yeah, there's absolutely no guarantee that you're going, uh, uh, that your decision is going to lead to successful results. Okay, and then the third uh, outlook is the, is very closely associated with the risk taking versus risk avoidance, and that's the innovative versus legacy cultural outlook. Uh, uh, basically, if you're risk taking, you're more likely to be more willing to be innovative, to do new things that people haven't done before, to have fresh outlooks, to see things with fresh eyes. Uh, that you never take uh, for granted uh, that your rules and your operations and procedures are the best. You're always saying, "Is there some better way to do things?" The uh, uh, the uh, legacy cultural outlook is, "Hey, if it ain't broke, why do we need to fix it?" And my I maintain again from my experience and from some of the uh, research has been carried out, that the legacy outlook is far safer, it's far more dominant, uh, people uh, uh, are reluctant to go out and do things that might get them in trouble, it's much, it's much easier to continue doing things the way they've done before, and if it does break, uh, then you fix it. No one's saying that you're against fixing things, but 
Now, basically, if it ain't broken, then don't fix it. You don't need to fix it. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on how decisions of consequence are strongly affected by organizational context. Okay, thank you.